In this video, we're going to use the SALPs that were presented in part one and use these to derive ligand field diagrams for three molecules in OH symmetry. We're going to be examining all manganese 2 plus species. So we're going to look at a manganese hexaamine. We're going to be looking at manganese hexachloro species, and we're going to be looking at manganese hexacyano species, all in nominal OH symmetry. Here, the hexamine is a sigma-only donor. The hexachloro species, we have pi donor ligands, and with the hexacyano species, we have pi acceptor ligands. Just to remind us of the orbitals that are going to be involved in bonding, for our manganese, we're going to be concerned with the 3d orbitals, the 4s, and the 4p orbitals. These define our valence orbitals. For the chloro ligands, we're going to be concerned with the 3p orbitals. Those are the ones that are energetically available to bind into the manganese center. For NH3, we're concerned with that A1 symmetry HOMO that comprises the nominal nitrogen 2p lone pair. And for the cyano ligands, we're concerned with the HOMO that binds in in a sigma fashion and the LUMO that will bind in in a pi-type fashion. These were described in detail in the previous video. We're going to start by constructing a molecular orbital diagram for the manganese hexaamine compound. So just starting off, drawing our energy axis. We're going to put manganese on this side, and then the salks for our six amine ligands over here. What we're going to find in general is that the orbitals for the amine ligands that are going to be interacting with the orbitals for the manganese ion are going to be lower in energy than the manganese atomic orbitals. This is what we're going to refer to as a so-called normal ligand field. And this occurs when the ligand orbitals are lower in energy than the metal orbitals that they're going to be interacting with. Filling in the atomic orbitals for manganese, we have our four Ps that are T1U symmetry, the 4S, which is totally symmetric, A1G, and the five 3d orbitals, which transform as eg and t2g orbitals. These are going to be interacting with the six salcs that you form for the six amine ligands in OH symmetry that transform as a1g, eg, and t1u symmetry. First, going through and taking care of our non-bonding orbitals, those orbitals that have no symmetry-related orbitals to mix in with, the T2Gs, are going to come over and form a non-bonding set. So the 3DXC, 3DYZ, and 3DXY in OH symmetry in a sigma-only bonding fashion are non-bonding orbitals. The rest of the orbitals can bind with the salcs. So the T1Us can bond in to the T1Us on the metal, forming a bonding and an anti-bonding pair. The A1G, the 4S, forms an antibonding combination 
with the cell. And then finally, we have the EGs, the metal 3Ds, form an antibonding pair and a bonding pair. The number of valence electrons that we're dealing with are 12 electrons from the NH3 ligands plus 5 from the manganese 3D orbitals. So that equals a grand total of 17 valence electrons. Going through and filling this in, we get this. Now if you look, these orbitals here that I'm boxing in, this is the same result that we get from crystal field theory. So using this molecular orbital approach, we're getting the same splitting that we get in crystal field theory, where this here is defined as 10dq, which is equal to delta O in this case. So this is the physical basis for getting that 2 over 3 splitting in an OH field using these sigma-only donors. Their T2G orbitals come across as non-bonding, and the EG come across as anti-bonding. So they're higher in energy than the T2G orbitals, and they're separated by the energy 10dq, which is equal to delta O. The orbitals that I have boxed in are referred to as your metal d orbitals. And the reason is because these are closest in energy to your 3d, so they're going to be most resembling 3d atomic orbitals more so than the ligand-based orbitals. They're still going to be combinations of ligand and metal atomic orbitals combining, but they're going to look most like manganese 3d orbitals. Your T2G orbitals in this case, in fact, are manganese atomic orbital-like. So they just look like the atomic orbitals from manganese. The EG star orbitals, on the other hand, are going to look like combinations from those salcs into the manganese. They're the antibonding orbitals. So these metal 3Ds are antibonding in the sigma case. So, just going through and drawing out what these look like. One of your EG star is going to be based on the DZ squared orbital. So that's your manganese 3DZ squared. But we're antibonding to those salcs. And you notice I've drawn this with a lot of manganese 3dz squared character and minimal ligand character bonding in because it's a manganese dominated orbital. It's closest in energy to the manganese and not the amines. The other one is based on 3dz squared, 3dx squared minus y squared, I mean. Once again, it's anti-bonding. So that's what that looks like. So this would be your quote 3dz squared, and this is your quote 3dx squared minus y squared orbital. But they're really molecular orbitals because they have ligand character in them. I'm now going to go through and derive the ligand field diagram for the manganese hexachloro species, which has pi donor ligands. The 3pz orbitals on the chlorines 
are going to behave as sigma donors. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the sigma donor molecular orbital diagram that we just derived and add the pi interactions on top of that. So what we have now is the sigma only diagram resulting from the sigma type interactions between the manganese atomic orbitals and the chlorine 3pz orbitals. And then we have the salps from the chlorine 3px and 3py orbitals. And we're going to do the same thing that we did before. We're going to bring across those orbitals that don't have symmetry-related partners to bond with. So the A1g and the A1g star are going to come across. The EG and EG stars are going to come across from the salcs. We're going to have the T2u orbitals and the T1gs that are going to come across as being non-bonding. Now remember what we said in the last video, that the T1u orbitals that are formed from the salps are going to be much more weakly interacting with the T1u's here formed in the sigma type interaction. So we're going to have only a minor perturbation in the energy relative to the sigma only case for the T1u's. So that's going to yield T1U here, T1U here, and then a slight elevation of that T1U star. This now leaves us with our T2G and T2G salks that we have to consider. So we're going to have the T2G salcs coming down here. Forming a bonding and an anti-bonding combination here. Like this. Going through and counting our valence electrons for our six chlorides. We have 36 valence electrons for the 3pz, 3px, and 3py. For the manganese, we have five valence electrons. This gives us a total of 41 electrons we need to deal with. The first 36 fell, fill these orbitals that are similar in energy to the salcs from the chlorine pi type system and the chlorine sigma type system. The remaining five, therefore, occupy the T2G star and the EG star. As before, we define these as our metal d orbitals, separation between the ET2G star and the EG star is equal to 10 dQ, or delta O in this case. We can go through and draw what these look like. In this case, our EG star orbitals look the same as what we got from the sigma case, but now the T2G star, because these are no longer non-bonding orbitals, they no longer look like the atomic orbitals from manganese. Instead, there are antibonding orbitals from the manganese 3Ds and the salcs derived from the chlorine uh, 3Ps. So here we have the T2G salcs. We're now going to put in the D orbitals such that they're antibonding, so they're out of phase with respect to the salcs. And here, because these T2G stars are closest in energy to the T2Gs. They're going to be dominated by those manganese 3D orbitals. So 
So here's the quote 3D XZ. Quote 3D YZ. and the 3D XY. And now, as with the sigma donor case, we arrive at the same qualitative picture that we arrived at using crystal field theory using this ligand field theory approach. It's just now that not only are these EG orbitals antibonding, but the T2G orbitals are antibonding as well. This raises the energy of the T2G orbitals relative to what that would be in the sigma only case. We're now going to draw the ligand field diagram for the manganese hexacyano species, which contains pi accepting cyanide ligands. As before, we'll start with the sigma only ligand field diagram and build off of that. So here we have the sigma-only diagram resulting from the sigma-type interactions from the cyanide-sigma-type orbitals. Now when we draw in the, cy the six cyanide pi types, these are unfilled antibonding orbitals, and they're going to be higher in energy than the metal d orbitals. So these salcs get placed up here. And these are your T1U, T1G, T2U, and T2G type salcs. We're going to bring over those orbitals that have no symmetry partners first. Now we're going to start overlapping. First, these T1Us are going to come over virtually unaltered because the T1U salcs are up high in energy. These are going to become slightly elevated. These are going to become slightly de-elevated. We're just going to put them there. Now we have our T2Gs that we have to worry about. So we're going to form a bonding combination here and an antibonding combination here. Now considering our valence electrons from the six cyanides, we have 12 valence electrons, two from each of those sigma orbitals. Remember, these pi type orbitals are all unfilled antibonding orbitals. And then from the manganese, we have five valence electrons for a total of 17 valence electrons. So filling those in. We have our 12 electrons from our ligand-based orbitals, and then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 from the manganese. And we made this low spin because 10dq, which is equal to delta O, is large for our formal metal d orbitals because now this T2G is bonding in nature because it's lower in energy, closer to those d orbitals, than these unfilled pi star type orbitals from the cyanide. Going through and approximating what they look like, these EG star look the same 
as in the signal only case? Well, now the T2Gs are no longer the antibonding combinations from the P or pi type cells. They're now the bonding combinations. So going through and drawing these. So here we have the T2G salks formed from the cyano pi star combinations and drawing in the d orbitals. We have this as your 3D XZ, but now these are in phase with the ligands. The 3D YZ. Now, metal dominated, but in phase as a bonding orbital. And the 3D XY, once again, it's metal dominated, but it's a bonding combination. So this is what the T2G orbitals will look like in this pi acceptor type case. Using ligand field theory, we can explain the origin of the spectrochemical series. So if we rate 10dq increasing in value, we said that pi donors give small ligand field splitting values. These are followed by sigma only donors which are followed by pi acceptors. We can look and see how the energy of the d orbitals trend as we change it from these ligands from pi donors to sigma only donors to pi acceptors. Starting with the sigma only donor case, you have your eg star orbitals so the 3dz squared and the 3dx squared minus y squared, which are sigma antibonding combinations with ligand, ligand salps. In the sigma only donor case, your T2g orbitals are non-bonding orbitals. There are no symmetry related orbitals that those can bond to. To a first approximation going from the sigma only donor case to either the pi acceptor or the pi donor, these EG stars don't really change that much in energy. So we're just going to keep them the same, assuming that the sigma donor strength stays the same. This is, of course, not true from complex to complex because the bonding is going to be different, but to a first approximation, we're going to keep that just to show why this trend exists. In the case of your pi donors, these T2G orbitals are no longer non-bonding. Instead, they're anti-bonding with the low-lying filled salps. So they become anti-bonding orbitals and they're T2G stars. In the case of the pi acceptors, the salps that make up the pi bonding interactions are high-lying unfilled orbitals. So these T2Gs become bonding orbitals and they go lower in energy. So we're going from anti-bonding orbitals to non-bonding orbitals to bonding orbitals. The influence of this is that as you go across, 10dq systematically increases because we're mostly influencing the energy of that T2G orbital relative to that EG orbital. The EGs remain antibonding throughout, but as you go across, you go from an antibonding T2G star to a non-bonding T2G to a bonding T2G type orbital. In the final video on basics of ligand field theory, we're gonna look at symmetries beyond OH symmetry.